The next generation of the internet is going to be pretty wild. There will be virtual gyms where robots go to train and download new brains, cars that play video games to learn how to drive themselves, and real-time universal translators that will let us talk to anyone anywhere in the world. Want to know what they all have in common? My name is Alex, and I'll show you by looking at the science behind the stocks. The science behind these capabilities is something called digital, digital twins. twins. And as crazy as that may seem, what inspired them is even crazier. It's mid-April 1970, and on their way to the moon, three men are finishing up a live television broadcast from the command module of the Odyssey spacecraft. Their mission is Apollo 13. Mission Commander James Lovell, father of four. Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes, father of three and command module pilot John Swigger, who was actually a last-minute replacement for another pilot that had to be grounded after getting exposed to the measles. The broadcast they just finished actually wasn't even covered by most major news networks, because America had just had men walk on the moon twice in the last year. Apollo 11, which was manned by Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins, happened less than a year ago. Apollo 12, which was manned by Pete Conrad, Alan Bean, and Richard Gordon, happened just a few months after that. So even though James Lovell, Fred Hayes, and John Swigert were rocketing through space at thousands of miles per hour, no one was really surprised that things were going so smoothly. It was business as usual. They were over 200,000 miles away from Earth when they finished their broadcast. And that's when things stopped going so smoothly. Ten minutes after they finished their broadcast, a faulty wire in the service module of the spacecraft caused one of the two onboard oxygen tanks to explode. What the crew heard was a loud bang, followed by the master alarm and a warning that there had been an electrical power failure. That's when Commander James Lovell said those famous words to NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. Houston, we have a problem. Down on Earth, Mission Control was getting readings that Apollo 13 had just lost two of their three fuel cells and one of their two oxygen tanks, and the remaining oxygen tank was draining fast. After the explosion, the crew had almost no power, no water, and was running out of air. Not to mention that the explosion actually knocked them well off course. It seemed like an impossible scenario to even wrap your head around, much less overcome. Changing an astronaut procedure usually takes many weeks and many more approvals. In the hours that followed, NASA's Mission Control improvised new procedures to use Apollo 13's lunar module as a space-based lifeboat. The three astronauts would have to make their way home in the lunar module and then switch back to the better shielded command module right for atmospheric re-entry. But unlike the command module, the lunar module was only meant for two people, not three. The third person was supposed to stay in orbit. One of the biggest challenges here was that its carbon dioxide scrubbers couldn't keep up with three grown men constantly breathing. So Mission Control had the astronauts use duct tape to jerry-rig the scrubbers from the command module to work with the lunar module as well. Even though they were pretty cramped, at least now all three astronauts could breathe. But as it turned out, they only had enough oxygen for about two or three days. So the next step was to figure out how to get them back to Earth before they ran out of resources. Counterintuitively, Beelining it back to Earth wasn't the best option. Just pointing the lunar module back at Earth and burning as hard as you can ran the risk of engine failure and might not have gotten them back home in time at all. After all, the lunar module wasn't really designed for this sort of long-distance burn. So instead, Mission Control decided to have them burn towards the moon. Then they would use the moon's gravity to slingshot them back to Earth, adding the necessary speed to the lunar module's engine burn to actually make it back in time. I want this marked all the way back to Earth with time to spare. We never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. After 143 hours, on April 17th, 1970, the crew re-entered Earth's atmosphere, deployed their parachutes, and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. All three astronauts made it back alive. Whew, that story gets me every time. The heroic efforts of the Apollo 13 crew is actually one of the biggest reasons I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up and why I loved working in the space industry. But the astronauts weren't the only heroes in that story. Let me give you a little context here. 1970 was a year before Intel even invented the central processing unit. The best mainframe computers of the time, like the ones they'd have at NASA, were thousands of times less powerful than the cell phone or computer that you're watching this on right now. So how did Mission Control figure out the procedures that the crew would need to follow in order to maintain their oxygen levels? How did they decide on the exact directions and burns that the lunar module's thrusters would need to make to slingshot around the moon and make it back to Earth? Or that they could even get back to Earth in the first place? 
even with the computers that we have today, that seems like a daunting task. And that's not even thinking about their serious time crunch, since those astronauts were losing oxygen by the minute. How did they do it all in a matter of hours? The answer is that they had a physical twin of the spacecraft, a complete replica. So as obvious as it sounds, they figured out how to make those CO2 scrubbers work with duct tape and plastic bags by literally picking them up on Earth and trying it, knowing that the astronauts had those exact same things up in space. And whenever there's a new challenge in the spacecraft, Mission Control could recreate it back on Earth in a way that the computers of the time simply couldn't match. And by the way, NASA doesn't just have replicas of their smaller spacecraft. NASA has a massive 6 million gallon pool in Houston, Texas called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. This pool is where astronauts train for spacewalks or any activity that takes them outside a spacecraft. The Neutral Buoyancy Lab is filled with full-scale mock-ups of modules from the International Space Station, space vehicles like the SpaceX Dragon, and the exact equipment that astronauts would have access to while they're working in them. Talk about a cool place to work. The reason Apollo 13's astronauts made it home over 50 years ago is the same reason this pool exists today. NASA understands the power of building models, but not every system can have a full-scale, physical twin. Think about massive, complex systems like oil rigs, or cruise ships, or wind turbines, or our power grids and road networks. Even if they were scaled down, physical models just aren't practical for a wide variety of reasons. That's why, after successfully saving the Apollo 13 crew, NASA coined the term digital twin, a living, virtual representation of something physical. When a system changes in real life, its digital twin updates the same way. For Apollo 13, the digital twin was actually built after the astronauts came home. It took in sensor data from the real spacecraft to recreate the events leading up to the Apollo 13 accident. Then, from that model, they could figure out what went wrong and how to fix it for next time. But is Apollo 13's digital twin really the same thing as the ones that will power the next generation of the internet? Well, actually yes, but I should clarify a few things here first. Unlike physical models, or real twins, digital twins don't need to look like their physical counterparts. For example, a company called Palantir collects and organizes large amounts of data from sensors, machines, and computers to build digital twins of industrial assets. It may be pretty impractical to build a physical replica of a wind farm. But the digital twin of one could just be a small network of data sources and functions that mirror how a real wind farm would behave. A list of their locations and heights, and the speeds and angles of their blades, the outputs of different wind and weather models, status updates from the local power grid, and all of the other real-time information streaming in from the turbines themselves. All that data can then be used to monitor and assess the health and performance of each turbine instead of having to go out and visually inspect each one. You can even take it a step further by connecting each digital twin to the control system of its physical turbine. Then you can steer the real turbines by steering their digital twins. The trick here is that even though the digital twin does doesn't look like a wind turbine, it has all the necessary information to behave like one. Now let's take it a step further. In addition to looking at things like health and status, you can simulate the effects of different wind patterns or bad weather or power outages. Then you can use that information to reduce risk and plan contingencies just like NASA does with the physical twins of their spacecraft. So digital twins let you do everything, from look at performance in the past, to controlling things in the present, and even simulating and planning for the future. On that note, it's important to point out that digital twins are not just about modeling and simulation. You can build a traffic simulator to model different kinds of intersections, simulate different levels of traffic, and then measure the overall flow of cars through each intersection to find the best design. In my previous life before YouTube, this is actually the kind of modeling and simulation that I did when I worked for MIT, except for radars and telescopes. But that's not really enough to be a digital twin. Instead, a digital twin would be the twin of a real intersection that changes with the real world. Data from sensors and cameras at the intersection would stream into a database and would be used to know when there are issues that need to be addressed at that actual location. Car accidents, road hazards, bad weather, and so on. Likewise, you could simulate the effects of these things ahead of time to figure out what you would do if they happened in that specific spot in real life. It's all about digitizing something that actually exists. All right. Now let's talk about the future of the internet. Today, thanks to much smaller sensors, much better computers, and much faster wireless connections, it's possible to make digital twins update in near real time. So now businesses can see the current state of their most important assets from anywhere in the world. 
simulate what would happen to them in a wide variety of conditions, and even control the physical assets from their digital twins. So what's the next step, and what makes this concept such a big deal in my opinion? Well, I believe that the future of this kind of work will take place inside a fully integrated digital twin of the entire world. Sounds pretty crazy, right? Well, maybe not as crazy as you think. Think about Google Earth today. We can already use that to view any part of the world in extreme detail. Not only that, but we can use the same tool to make measurements, discover new places to go and plan travel routes, see how most of the world has changed year over year, and even see how rising sea levels would change coastal cities in the future based on their elevation today. Google Earth is one coherent model of the world that many different services can be built on top of, but Google Earth only gets updated about once a month, and the average piece of map data on it is anywhere between one and three years old. Now imagine a version of Google Earth that was updated in real time. We'd be able to see traffic and construction zones when planning our routes. We'd be able to predict the weather for any specific location and actually predict its effects there. The same tool could be used to plan large scale logistics, last mile deliveries, disaster relief efforts, movie shoots, and much more, all because it would be built on top of a digital twin of the world and everything in it. That's exactly the idea behind NVIDIA's Omniverse, which is trying to create the most accurate digital twin of the world and everything in it, just like Google created the most accurate model of the world and everything on it. Extended to vast scales, a digital twin is a virtual world that's connected to the physical world. And in the context of the internet, it is the next evolution. And that's what NVIDIA Omniverse is about. Digital twins, virtual worlds, and the next evolution of the internet. The idea for the Omniverse actually came from Pixar, who needed a way to set up complicated 3D scenes so that hundreds of artists could collaborate on them at once. That's a pretty tall order, and to solve the problem, Pixar developed the Universal Scene Description, or USD. USD is a system for representing the elements, the physics, and the interactions that make up a moving 3D scene. That way, one team can work on character models, while another team works on environments, and so on. Then the Universal Scene Description describes how everything works together. Well, Pixar open-sourced this USD standard, and it's been widely adopted by huge companies around the world. For example, Autodesk, which makes 3D modeling programs used in engineering, architecture, and entertainment, has USD integrations. So does Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite and the Unreal Engine. And Apple uses USD to represent all of their augmented and virtual reality scenes. So this is already a well-adopted standard. But NVIDIA's Omniverse is the first application purpose-built entirely around this universal scene description. What Pixar's shared workflow did for large movie scenes, Omniverse does for every other industry, from architecture and engineering to art and game design. That means that one part of a factory engineering team can be working on the digital twins of different robots, while a separate team works on the conveyor belt systems, a third team works on architecting the building, and so on, all in different industry-specific programs. Then, they plug in their models into a shared scene hosted on the Omniverse. If somebody makes an update to their designs, an Omniverse connector would push it to every shared scene that the model is used in as well. For example, let's say that Tesla uploads a digital twin of one of their Gigafactories to the Omniverse so that they can simulate different production layouts or test scenarios where different robots would fail. Those are real business cases for them to leverage the Omniverse. But if Tesla allowed it, a movie studio could buy a copy of that same Gigafactory model, including its behaviors in different conditions, and then use it in a movie scene. Or students can interact with it during a virtual field trip. Heck, even investors could check out how their facilities are changing over time and count the cars as they come out of the production line. When Tesla makes a public update to that Gigafactory's digital twin, every end user would decide if they want that update as well. Kind of like how our apps already update today. What this unlocks for businesses is the ability for multiple teams to collaborate on shared 3D scenes of any kind at any scale, which sounds a whole lot like the kind of platform that could power the next generation of web applications. Weather services could upload weather data and models for everyone to use. Connected cars could upload traffic data for logistics and delivery companies to plan and adjust their routes. Think about how this set of tools could enhance everything we already use the internet for today. 3D instead of 2D, interactive instead of reactive, real-time instead of weeks or months behind, all because it would be built on top of a digital twin of the world and everything in it. 
Hopefully this episode helped you learn a little bit about digital twins, their crazy origin story, and some of the ways they could power the next generation of the internet. Let me know in the comments if you think this is a future worth investing in, and if you want to see more deep dives into different parts of the Omniverse. Want to see what other future tech I think is worth investing in? Check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, hit those like and subscribe buttons to let me know that you enjoy this type of content. Either way, thanks for watching. And until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.